Registered Phenomena Code 954 Object Class Gamma Orange Hazard Types Animated Grouped Sapient Mechanical Geological Extraterrestrial Extradimensional Destabilization Info Hazard Containment Protocols Due to the status of RPC-954 as equally existing within a parallel reality and our own, full containment is impossible. However, the location of RPC-954-1 has made it such that large-scale containment efforts are not required. As RPC-954-1 located within 500 meters of Site-019, constant monitoring of RPC-954-1 from Site-019 has been established and is to be maintained at all times. In the event that an unknown individual or vehicle exits RPC-954-1, personnel are to be mobilized to capture the entity. While RPC-954 is technically a manifestation of RPC-955 and by extension a manifestation of RPC-956, its properties and the nature of its existence are completely different from that of both RPC-955 and RPC-956. Access to RPC-954 requires that the person entering RPC-954-1 is operating an industrial vehicle and has a legitimate fear of a nuclear holocaust. Individuals that access RPC-954 through RPC-954-1 will enter RPC-954 within the vehicle that they entered RPC-954-1 in. If an individual is not operating an industrial vehicle, but who have consumed large amounts of tonally dark science fiction media, enters RPC-954-1, they will access RPC-955. When an individual is not afraid of a nuclear holocaust and is in a state of intense exhaustion, emotional detachment, or apathy, enters RPC-954-1, they will access RPC-956. If an individual that accesses RPC-956 through RPC-954-1 was operating a vehicle when they entered RPC-954-1, it will not manifest within RPC-956 and remain within RPC-954-1 until retrieved. If an individual does not meet any of the aforementioned conditions when entering RPC-954-1, then no anomalous effect will occur. Description. RPC-954 is a designation of an alternate reality, accessible in an 18km square area of the lunar surface, that has been designated RPC-954-1. RPC-954-1 itself is almost completely indistinguishable from the rest of the lunar surface, with no notable features or geology when compared to the rest of the lunar surface. Examination of RPC-954 using a large variety of tests including the use of an AECR, has revealed that RPC-954 has an ACS of 3. When an individual accesses RPC-954, they will be able to perceive and interact with all contents of RPC-954 within the area of RPC-954-1 and the RPC-954 reality. Individuals outside of RPC-954 are capable of perceiving and interacting with subjects that have been within RPC-954 for less than 18 hours without issue, but are unable to perceive or interact with objects or subjects that have been within RPC-954 for any longer. Subjects and objects that have been within RPC-954 for less than 36 hours can exit RPC-954 by leaving the area of RPC-954-1. Due to the nature of these subjects, have been known to be relocated during their exiting of RPC-954. For example, if a subject exits RPC-954 in a place where an individual outside of RPC-954-1 is standing, then the exiting subject will exit RPC-954 at a random point along RPC-954-1's perimeter. Additionally, if an individual with an RPC-954 exits a vehicle that they used to enter RPC-954, they will be ejected from RPC-954 at a random point along RPC-954-1's perimeter. RPC-954 itself appears extremely similar to conceptual looning mining operations, with various automated mining vehicles being seen across the RPC-954 lunar surface. 
Exploration of RPC-954 has revealed that various industrial buildings and structures are present within the area of RPC-954-1. These structures have been known to occasionally appear within our home reality without warning, but have proven to be completely harmless while within our reality. Examination of the structures and vehicles present within RPC-954 have revealed that the new Corp logo can be found on all equipment in RPC-954. Additionally, the examination of documents within the various structures of RPC-954 has revealed that the entirety of all machinery and industrial equipment within RPC-954 was brought to the moon by New Corp. Please see Addendum Point 1 for documents recovered from RPC-954. Subjects that have reported observing the Earth while within RPC-954 have stated that the Earth appears to be in a state of ruin. Various craters, centered on the locations of major population centers in our world, are prominently visible on its surface. Additionally, observation of the RPC-954 Earth during the night has failed to show any signs of advanced human civilization anywhere on the planet. All of the mining equipment in RPC-954 is completely automated, and is capable of repairing itself without human intervention. Observations of the automated machinery within RPC-954 determines that it is sapient. The machinery within RPC-954 commonly uses as sapients to increase the efficiency in which they are able to mine materials and manufacture more mining equipment. This sapience has also been observed within the factories and refineries within RPC-954. The automated equipment seems unable to acknowledge the existence of any entities that enter RPC-954. The reason for this phenomenon is unknown. Because of this, all the factories, refineries, and mining equipment within RPC-954 have formed a simplistic religious society. This society revolves around the worship of humanity, which they refer to as the Creator Race, and as a result of this worship, the Society of Machines in RPC-954 constantly seek to expand their operations with the goal of retaking Earth, which they refer to as the Mother Planet. Addendum. Recovered Documents Lunar Mining Operations Orientation As you are no doubt aware, New Corp has begun to invest in lunar mining operations. At the request of various governments, we are stationing humans at our lunar facilities to monitor and maintain our systems. And this is where you come in. We at New Corp have selected you because you are the best that we could find on short notice. And if you are reading this, then that means you have agreed to this program. We should state that we will provide more than enough food, water, and oxygen to ensure that you can survive the harsh lunar environment. Additionally, we request that you avoid interacting with the machinery directly, unless it is required for maintenance. You should also be aware that we designed a system there to be completely self-sustaining and self-expanding. We at New Corp wish you the best of luck on your lunar mission. I am happy that I was chosen for this job. I know the resource problem is really affecting life down on Earth, and knowing that I am making a difference and if I am not required makes me really happy. I am glad that I am helping my wife and daughter, and if they don't get to talk to me often. Though I must say that I am concerned with the recent news of tensions that have been arising between the powers that be down on Earth. Ever since the anomalous was brought to the attention of the general public, things have been spiraling out of control. I can only imagine what it's like to be part of the Authority now, not that I could imagine it before all hell broke loose. Shipment Details Essentials Due to the recent increase of tensions between various nations and governments, New Corp does not know if we will be able to provide reliable resupplies in the coming months. Because of this, we are sending enough supplies to last lunar mining operations for at least the next three to four months. While we believe that this measure is ultimately be unnecessary, you can never be too careful. Best of wishes from the New Corp executives. New Corp Automated Mining Expedition System Communication with Earth HQ not detected. Response Scan for human life. Commencing planetary scan. Scan complete. No human life detected. Course of action Stop sending resources from Luna to the mother planet. Increased rate of factory construction. Increased rate of production. Increased rate of resource extraction and refinement. Increased rate of expansion. Outline clear.
Beginning outline. Disabling shipment services. Success. Increasing construction rate. Success. Increasing rate of production. Success. Increasing rate of resource extraction and refinement. Success. Increasing rate of expansion. Success. Opening note. The creator race will be remembered. Closing note. Returning to normal function. Register Phenomena Code 955 Object Class Gamma Orange Hazard Types Grouped Hazard Extradimensional Hazard Immeasurable Hazard Info Hazard Destabilization Hazard Containment Protocols Due to the status of RPC-955 as a parallel reality, full containment is currently impossible at this time. However, Containment of the multitude of access points leading to RPC-955 is both possible and a currently ongoing endeavor. Although RPC-955 is technically a different manifestation of RPC-956, the containment protocols listed in RPC-956 do not apply to RPC-955. Entrance to RPC-955 is entirely dictated upon whether or not the person accessing it has consumed large amounts of tonally dark science fiction media in their lifetime. If the accessing person has not seen a significant amount of science fiction, they will instead manifest inside RPC-956. In the event someone meeting the criteria accesses RPC-955, personnel stationed inside RPC-955 are to apprehend them and interrogate them, before forcibly ejecting them from RPC-955. RPC-955 can be accessed, provided the person accessing it meets the criteria described above, via a multitude of ways, the most prominent of which being that the person accessing it is in an area with a sufficiently low light level, in an area where the weather is either raining and or snowing, smoking a cigarette, reading, watching science fiction media in the aforementioned setting. If the person is doing two or more of these things, they will enter RPC-955 and will be designated RPC-955-1. Authority personnel have been stationed inside RPC-955 at multiple entry points to apprehend instances of RPC-955-1. RPC-955 is a reality that is splintered off from our own via the large consumption of the 1980s dark futuristic aesthetic in modern culture. Entrances to RPC-955 are almost always able to be easily spotted at entry points, due to objects being able to cross into our reality from RPC-955, these objects looking extremely different to any modern technology or standard objects in our reality. These objects, if found, are to be sent to Site-016 and labeled as lesser anomalies for storage. The reality of RPC-955 takes on the appearance of a futuristic version of the modern New York City, bearing the same name and recognizable street names and landmarks. However, technological advancement in this reality is far beyond that of our own baseline reality, in such ways comparable to popular cyberpunk fiction. The technological advancements have only been in areas of private industrialization and or military applications and not in ways as to benefit the lower classes of society. Due to this, the lower middle class in RPC-955 can be comparable to baseline realities impoverished citizens, despite the advanced technology in our reality. Numerous technologies in RPC-955 are physically and technically impossible, along with numerous architectural designs and inconsistencies in the societal structure. For instance, no farms have ever been found inside RPC-955, nor has the city ever seemed to end. According to residents of RPC-955, designated RPC-955-2 instances, food is transported from other cities. However, no other cities have been found inside RPC-955, only New York City. The largest structure discovered in RPC-955 is 
according to RPC-955-2 instances, 35,786 km tall, and reaches in a low Earth orbit. The structure has yet to be explored entirely, as the money required to access some floors is too expensive for testing personnel to acquire in a reasonable time period. Proposals have been put forward to station trusted low-level personnel inside RPC-955 permanently. However, no personnel have ever willingly asked to be stationed inside RPC-955 for a long enough time to become attached. Inside RPC-955 exists a multitude of factions vaguely resembling baseline reality nations and corporations, the most notable of which have been labeled RPC-955-3 instances. Factions that know of our reality are labeled RPC-955-3A whereas factions that are unaware are labeled RPC-9553-B. There are a total of three recorded RPC-9553 instances, two of which are not categorized groups of interest, nor RPC-9553-A instances. The singular recorded RPC-9553-A instance is, seemingly, the group of interest Nucorp, which, at some unrecorded point in the past, established a foothold inside RPC-955. New Corp, hence referred to as RPC-9553-A, is active inside RPC-955, and has a significant amount of influence over other factions and several smaller street gangs. RPC-9553-A have been observed using these smaller factions as a cumulative source of manpower, and as a way to expand their influence upon other factions inside RPC-955. RPC-9553-A has given Authority personnel much information regarding the cultural history and technological advancements inside RPC-955, which can be found below. They have also given personnel most of the information about RPC-955 that is found in this document, which could not have been easily gathered through testing. The Anthropology Department RPC-955, despite being a parallel reality, and entirely separate from our baseline reality, shares numerous similarities with normal cultural development in our version of the explored area of RPC-955, that being New York City. The factions discovered inside RPC-955 show similarities to stereotypical street gangs and or mafias found in the region, and to corrupt corporations such as RPC-9553-A, referred to as just New Corp for the purposes of this overview, also shows symptoms of being blown up stereotypes of baseline reality corporate behaviors. However, <clears throat> however, the same may be said for the entirety of RPC-955 as a whole, since the observed class system is such that, if it were established in our baseline reality, it would not last for more than three decades at most. The class system inside RPC-955 follows the same basic structure as the class system of the modern United States. However, the middle class seemingly ceases to exist inside RPC-955. The technological advancement found inside RPC-955 also does not follow normal growth, and instead has jumped all over the place in seemingly random areas. RPC-9553-A representatives have been mainly cooperative with Authority agents even going so far as to explain the lack of anomalies within an RPC-955. According to RPC-9553-A representatives, a machine was built in the RPC-955 timeline that nearly nullified anomalies, and brought the ACS level of the timeline down to a 1. The creators of this machine have been assumed to be the RPC-955 equivalent of the Authority. However, this has not been proven merely suspected. Attention. The following information has been declassified for all personnel above Level 0 clearance. Notice, RPC-955 is NOT the group of interest cataloged as the Righteous Central Protection Authority, nor does it have anything to do with this group of interest. Although the area depicted inside RPC-955 is notably similar to the timeline this group of interest originates from, it is entirely unrelated. Sightings of the RCPA insignia within RPC-955 are to be reported to GD-01 immediately.
Registered Phenomena Code 956 Object Class Gamma Orange Hazard Types Grouped Hazard Extra-Dimensional Hazard Immeasurable Hazard Newtonian Hazard Info Hazard Emotional Hazard Destabilization Hazard Containment Protocols While RPC-956 is not currently containable, given its status as an extra-dimensional space, access to and from RPC-956 can be monitored and restricted. As any hyperlink in use on any standard browser can provide access to RPC-956, provided that a potential RPC-956-1 is in the proper emotional state. Containment currently focuses on the dissimulation of emotion altering memetics on authority-owned internet servers and computing systems to minimize the risk that staff members enter a state of emotional exhaustion, detachment, or apathy sufficient to enter RPC-956. In the event that an unauthorized individual experiences RPC-956 and attempts in any way to report on or otherwise share information about their experience, they are to be apprehended and amnesticized as per standard anomaly information suppression procedures. While limited public knowledge of RPC-956 is known to exist, the extremely surreal and inconsistent nature of the anomaly, coupled with its relative difficulty to access, has restricted this knowledge to a persistent urban legend. Authority personnel of all clearance levels who have become RPC-956-1 are to be monitored by a personal data recorder at all times and regularly contacted by test supervisory staff to ensure that their emotional state did not become sufficiently relaxed to permit the occurrence of RPC-956-3 during any subsequent visits to RPC-956. Low-level amnestics are to be provided on request to any and all staff members who have become RPC-956-1 instances and wish to forget or suppress the anomaly's profound emotional effects. Description. RPC-956 is an extra-dimensional area of space of inconsistent volume and contents, which can be accessed via the activation of standard internet hyperlinks by any human being in a specific emotional state. RPC-956 access has a baseline 65% chance of occurring whenever a conscious human being deliberately and willingly accesses a hyperlink on a computing device currently connected to the internet while in a state of intense exhaustion, emotional detachment, or apathy. The chances of access increase depending on the intensity or severity of these emotions, with access rates exceeding 90% when tests were performed with personnel experiencing all three simultaneously. Time of day also appears to have an effect on the rate of RPC-956 entry, with in excess of 68% of access events occurring between the hours of 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. local time. Individuals who access RPC-956 are classified as RPC-956-1. The exact nature of RPC-956 varies on a personal basis. While RPC-956-1 instances report strong thematic visual or structural similarity between their experiences, the anomalous spatial volume always demonstrates notable variations. All instances of RPC-956 explored thus far have an ACS value of 3. RPC-956 is normally unbounded, but finite, in the sense that traversal to any one of its edges will immediately bring the RPC-956-1 instance to the opposite edge. Spatially, most RPC-956 instances do not appear to exist on the surface of a sphere, and will instead appear as toroidal areas or visually endless flat planes. RPC-956-1 appear as they did in baseline reality and are capable of using any equipment brought with them as normal, though equipment depending on the receipt of an outside signal, such as GPS located, will display inconsistent or nonsensical readings. Photography and videography of the interior of RPC-956 is feasible, though the resultant recordings are usually difficult to parse visually. Common thematic elements noted and recorded during exploration of RPC-956 include the following. Regular geometric grid patterns receding infinitely into the distance. Mobile and stationary objects composed of white marble, frequently in the shape of Roman-style bust or 1990s-era computer equipment. Beach areas, incorporating either palm trees or symbolic representations thereof. Excessively large suns or glowing circles in the sky, usually in a constant state of rising or setting. 
suburb areas, filled with bungalow-style houses, nearly always accompanied by pools and arranged in spatially or geometrically impossible ways. Incorporeal messages or floating text, normally displaying vague or nonsensical phrases in the first language of the RPC-956-1 instance. These messages have always been observed to vanish when RPC-956-1 moves within an arm's length of them, with exact distances varying depending on the physical build of the individual RPC-956-1. Text in modern Japanese printed on flat surfaces. Analysis of images and readings by Japanese speakers reveal text to be garbled excerpts from the operating manuals of a variety of Japanese-made personal electronic products all developed between 1983 and 1996. Continuous and slightly atonal music emanating from no specific source, which RPC-956-1 instance is nearly universally described as weird but not unpleasant. Cityscape area, containing abstract structures resembling geometrically simplified urban buildings, inhabited by entities designated RPC-956-2. More than half of all RPC-956-1 individuals have reported the presence of humanoid entities within an RPC-956, designated RPC-956-2. These entities resemble abstracted or simplified human silhouettes, which faintly emanate light in a variety of bright pastel colors. RPC-956-2 are incorporeal and vanish from sight when any RPC-956-1 makes physical contact with them. Numbers of RPC-956-2 differ between RPC-956 variations, but in all cases the numbers of RPC-956-2 have sporadically increased over time, with increases noted soon after the occurrences of RPC-956-3. See Addendum 1 below. RPC-956-2 appear to pantomime or act out a variety of motions corresponding with normal human behavior while within cityscape or suburb areas of RPC-956, and had never been discovered outside these areas in groups of more than two at a time. RPC-956-2 have been observed performing actions resembling conversations, physical disputes, consumption of food and water, and procreation. Document. Excerpt from RPC-956-1-A8 Journey Log This audio transcript was written from data sent by the personal recorder of RPC-956-1-88, junior researcher Mackenzie Anders. Testing was supervised by researcher Xavier Flores. This instance was Anders' third excursion into RPC-956, and has been selected for inclusion in this article for its relative clarity compared to other such documents and representative sampling of the emotional effects of RPC-956. Due to the inconsistent nature of the passage of time within RPC-956, standard time codes have been omitted. RPC-956-1-88 was operating a standard authority workstation within a testing and observation chamber on site, and wearing a standard testing jumpsuit, work boots, and personal data recorder. Alright, let's get this done. I feel like shit, Zabby. I know being out of it is part of the procedure, but goddamn, it's like part of me is convinced I'm not here anymore, you know? I know, Mac. Hit it whenever you're ready. RPC-956-1-88 clicks the test hyperlink provided. All personnel in direct line of sight experience an auditory hallucination characterized by a loud noise resembling a series of slightly distorted pure tones, taken the form of a five-note musical phrase. RPC-956-1-88 vanishes from his seat. His clothing, boots, data recorder, and a ballpoint pen in his left breast pocket dematerialize as well. At this point, transcript is taken purely from data recorder transmission. Ah, Christ. Oh, okay. I always hate that part. That fear. That stomach-dropping horror. It's past. Quicker than last time, I think. I'm feeling the same rising warmth. It's always a little warm here. Warm and soft on the skin. Like everything is pliable. Even the air. I'm on the… the beach. Water above me, slightly distorted, sunset orange clouds below. The sand under my feet is different than last time. Darker, more granular. 
Oh. It's not sand at all. It's little capacitors. Those tube-shaped things you see on circuit boards. All black plastic. And… oh. Oh. My feet aren't actually touching the ground. Somehow that doesn't seem important. I'm going to follow the orange lines, leading past that gigantic stone head coming out of the water up there. What's behind it? And what's that jagged, spinning thing coming out of the sky further down? And why do I want ever so much to see them? I know I don't care. That's what the sky riding over my right shoulder says. We know we don't care. But still, I want to see them very much. Data recorder says I've been walking for… six days now? I don't feel hungry or thirsty or anything. I think… I think that even if I did feel it, I wouldn't care anyways. I just genuinely… Honestly, from the seat of my being, I kind of want to keep exploring. I don't think there's any great revelation out there, but I feel… no, compelled is too strong a word. The thing is, the thing I saw on the horizon six days ago, it's like… it's like a tree of buildings. Each branch, each leaf, the outline of what might be an apartment building if you squint. <laughs> I know. I know what it reminds me of. Did you ever see that scene in Escape from New York, where they made a 3D image of a city by putting fluorescent tape on a bunch of black wooden boxes? It's… it's not quite like that, but it's close. I see the 956-2s, maybe two dozen from where I'm standing? They're walking from building to building, a few of them arm in arm. They don't seem to mind that the road is just an outline of purple light, bending around the trunk of the tree. Groups of them keep coming into and out of view as the tree spins. Hold on. Something's there. There's a group of them, maybe seven or eight, crowded around some sky riding. It's in a shadow of a building branch, maybe four stories? I can't quite make it out. Gotta get a better footing on this cloud. Momentary loss of sound as RPC-956-88-1 readjusts the data recorder. It's… can you imagine? Riding on the wall. RPC-956-1-88 materializes in the test chamber, in the same position as when he left. Elapsed objective time, 21.4 seconds. Mac, back so soon? How was the trip? Several seconds of silence. RPC-956-1-88 appears to have difficulty finding its balance. There was… there was a marble block in the shape of an Apple II in the clouds. I think I… I think I tripped. Addendum RPC-956-3 RPC-956-1 individuals describe persistent feelings of preternatural calm and mild attachment that persist after returning from RPC-956. If left untreated, the severity of these emotions increase with each subsequent return to RPC-956. In several cases, Individuals who have entered RPC-956 while in particularly unstable emotional states have not returned. An effect designated RPC-956-3. In all RPC-956-3 cases, final messages included or alluded to the following phrase. Sit back and ride the crest of it forever. Ride on the wave, the forever that never was, the clouds. Document From the desk of Senior Researcher Flores if you are reading this file and noting the distinct resemblance between and the aesthetic choice of a whole range of internet subcultures, then congratulations, we don't know why that is either. Is it some expression of the human subconscious? An offshoot of the collective intelligence of the internet age? Some anomalous prankster with a love for the 80s? Truthfully, I don't think it really matters. RPC-956 is nothing if not internally inconsistent and the best we can do to approach its surreal nature is to maintain objectivity and proper scientific detachment. We have lost too many to the wave, to the forever that never was already. Tread carefully. Registered Phenomena Code 661 Previous code LA020 Object Class Gamma Orange Hazard Types Destabilization Extradimensional Temporal Mind Control Immeasurable 
containment protocols. An on-site detachment, comprised of no less than five ASF personnel, is to be stationed outside of RPC-661 in a temporary housing location. They are to patrol the main structure and the adjacent grounds hourly for non-authorized persons, and must also restrict access to the site through primarily non-violent means. ASF personnel are to be equipped with stun guns and a supply of Class A-1 amnestics. All roads that lead to RPC-661 are to be barricaded, and a two-meter tall fence is to be maintained around the property. In addition, all research teams permitted within RPC-661 must be checked for signs of fatigue or exhaustion prior to entry. Medical staff are to issue transdermal stimulant patches capable of administering up to 200 mg of caffeine to anyone exhibiting these signs. Personnel are not permitted to be alone, lay down, or sit down for an extended period of time while in the main structure of RPC-661. Personnel are not permitted under any circumstances outside of testing to sleep inside RPC-661. Researchers with 2R clearance and above are freely permitted in the RPC-661 to study its minor reality coherency fluctuations. The FOA, MI-13, and UNAAC are to be given Level 0 affiliation clearance when jointly studying the area's minor anomalous traits. The Boons of Cult of Tablung is charged with the investigation, containment, and illumination of anomalous objects, persons, entities, and organizations that threaten the German nation and its people. Military Intelligence Section 13 is the security and protection of Great Britain and British overseas territories against anomalies of all kinds. United Nations Anomalous Activities Committee, the global regulatory body for official anomalous agencies such as the Authority, MI-13, FOA, and other such agencies. All personnel are to vacate RPC-661 from 2000 hours to 0800 CET pending Director Mason's approval for testing. Uniform 01, XD-N01 Exploration Specifications and Briefing RPC-661 XD-N01 Exploration Protocols Uniform 01 operatives chosen to reconnoiter XD-N01 are to be stationed inside the lower subsections of RPC-661 proper during the hours of 2100 to 0700 CET. Once in place, research personnel will administer an injection of 30-70 mg sodium thiopental, with a 0.5 mg per kilogram of 100 ml saline per minute, until the agents are mildly anesthetized. Mild anesthetization has been categorized in this case as a semi-lucid state, in which operatives can still respond to stimuli. An additional injection of 15 to 40 mg may be used intermittently throughout an expedition to maintain anesthesia. Simultaneously, the agents will be instructed to apply four drops of neoptisin to each eye. Additional dosages of neoptisin must be applied by research personnel post-anesthetization if anoptisin levels normalize. Due to the nature of XDN01's possible mimetic effects, Uniform 01 operatives must concurrently transcribe their findings during their expedition. Operatives are not permitted to interact directly with any entity encountered with an XDN01. Furthermore, Uniform 01 agents must actively avoid the following actions. Attempt to read any form of written language. Think about your baseline body in any way. Act independently of given instructions or without purpose. Reside with an XDN01 for more than four hours at a time. Close your eyes. Warning: Uniform 01 agents subjected to XDN01 and neoptisin are to remain under observational study 48 hours post-expedition. Research personnel are to document all medical and behavior abnormalities during this time. To date, they have documented migraines due to swelling of the stem and cortex of the brain. Excessive forgetfulness, predominantly to memories associated with XDN01. Some research staff believe this may be due to an antimimetic effect XDN01 has on those who traverse it. However, it may be related to the nature in which the Authority travels in and through XDN01. Minor to severe somnophobia. 
Somniphobia is the fear of falling asleep. It is often caused by intense nightmares or sleep paralysis. Enucleation of the eyes, or Oedipism A form of self-mutilation of the eye, often caused by psychosis or paranoid illusions. Cases of Oedipism related to RPC-661 have all been by agents eviscerating the inner contents of the eye. The method in which these agents have learned to perform such a procedure is currently unknown. Post-Incident 66101-N01, X-Ray 06 annulifiers, Archer Monitor worldwide reports of SADs and SIDs for possible connections to RPC-661. Sudden Arrhythmic Death Syndrome and Sudden Infant Death Syndrome are both unexplained conditions of which a subject dies in their sleep. These deaths often have no specific cause. The size and scope of RPC-661's ability to affect an individual's subconscious are currently unknown. Presently, XD-N01 and RPC-661 are pending reclassification to Omega. RPC-661 is the designation given to the abandoned Schwarzwald Academy located near Germany. The school, which ran from 1750 to 1897 was regarded as a prestigious academic and religious institution while in its prime. It served mostly the Prussian aristocracy, with a curriculum focused primarily on Lutheranism, philosophy and other Prussian ideals. However, in 1873, prominent occultist Abner Stur took over as the Academy's Grandmaster. Stur was believed to be heavily associated with several unnamed Nihil cults and more predominantly the Omega Iota Society of 1859. He was later ostracized from the latter group for unknown reasons. From this point on, little is known about what happened at the Academy until its suspected destruction and subsequent closure in 1897. During Stur's reign, several notable figures had either disappeared from the grounds or left the school due to reports of possible witchcraft. See Addendum 661-01. On October 1897, local sources claim that the Swatswald Academy had burned down in the night, killing the entire student body and staff. Despite these allegations, which were probable cover stories formulated by either the Stir or an unknown third party, the site was rediscovered in pristine condition by early FOA agents, following up on rumors of a haunted mansion in the woods in 1912. After initially being unable to find a source of the spatial anomalies within, the FOA formally turned the site over to the Authority in 1948. RPC-661 of the anomalous traits manifest solely inside the main Swatswald building. Minor reality coherency fluctuations appear randomly throughout the site. These fluctuations manifest as a drop in coherency no greater than minus 1.0 on the Anderson coherency scale. Researchers have noted that these fluctuations appear as fuzzy and distorted dim lights. Due to the relatively safe nature of these reality inconsistencies, the Authority and its allies have used the site as a means to familiarize new researchers with reality-based anomalies. Addendum 661-01 RPC Reclassification During a routine joint research expedition in 1957, Several researchers were observing a minor spatial distortion when the floor of the Grand Lecture Hall collapsed. Beneath the structure, an even larger subterranean chamber was discovered. This subcathedral was adorned with several banners depicting the nine Defic sons of the Nihil religion. The Children of Nihil is a religious collective that reveres the cleansing nature of floods and believes that through metamorphic trials and natural disasters, they can create a society that more aptly prolongs the values of their mentally disordered followers. Pillars of pure unmarked copper stood in each corner of the room, marking the four cardinal points. Additionally, all the stairwells and halls leading to this chamber have been bricked shut or purposely collapsed. Inside the room, researchers uncovered 364 corpses strapped to various pews and chairs. These remains designated RPC-661-1-364, appear to be organized in no discernible pattern. Each corpse dons a formal version of the school's scholarly robe, alongside a copper cage fixed to their heads by the use of a single nail driven through each temple. 
Researchers were able to cross-reference and identify several bodies to various students who attended Swatswald at the time of its closure. Despite having died in 1897, none of the bodies have shown any signs of decomposition. Autopsies performed on the remains have yet to yield any identifiable cause of death. Parallel to the main underground chapel, personnel discovered a small secondary chamber. The body of Grandmaster Stir, alongside several books and journals detailing the activities of the Academy staff, were discovered in what was believed to be a sacristy, also referred to as a vestry. A sacristy is a room within a church used for keeping various records and sacred vestments. These journals contain extensive records on the Apoptosites, a previously unknown secret society believed to be an offshoot of the Children of Nihil base reliefs and early Omega Iota society ideals. Based on the fundamental teachings of the Apoptosites and Stir's previous affiliations, Authority personnel have theorized this group is an entirely new subcult formed by him. Throughout Grandmaster Stir's incumbency, students became indoctrinated to worship the solar deities and various other entities. Referred to as Grand Civil Empadoc in all recovered religious texts, Several other possible references to Empedoc have been recorded by the Authority, ranging from 400 BC to 1800 BCE. The journals detail acts of pedophilia performed by the staff, and ritualistic sacrifices perpetrated among the students. According to recovered text, Stir influenced both the staff and student body to perpetuate these increasingly violent and debaucherous acts as a form of ceremonial corruption. This was done as a precursor to Apoptosite's ultimate goal, performing the Rite of Communion. Additional information on the Rite could not be located among the recovered records and scriptures. Stir's body, designated RPC-661-365, similarly showed no signs of decomposition. The corpse was originally discovered maintaining orthostasis, with both arms raised laterally 90 degrees with the palms facing downwards. Any attempts to move RPC-661-365 have been met with resistance by an unseen force. Upon closer inspection of the remains, researchers discovered scars on the base of the neck and upper cranium conducted the early forms of brain surgery. Several symbols built from copper were screwed in place beneath the skull. These symbols include various Hebrew-derived letters and a series of eye insignias placed throughout the telencephalon of the brain. The telencephalon is the highly developed anterior section of the forebrain. It consists mainly of both cerebral hemispheres. Addendum 661-02 XDN01 Discovery and Exploration Due to extensive analysis of the recovered text found within RPC-661, the departments of Theistic, Viteric, and Kabbalic studies began to theorize about the correlation between RPC-661-1 through Dash 365 and the minor spatial anomalies found throughout the site. Specific texts refer to quote, the section of the mind behind the eye and wall, unquote, which was quote, brought forth from the rite of communion to grant true sight. Unquote. This locale was later just simply named Unbektif by the members of Apotheosis. Inscribed below is an excerpt taken from Grandmaster Stir's 13th Book of Scripture. Sleep in the Master's house, he who has given you eyes and dominated you, so that you may dominate others. He who will rest among the sky next to you, brothers and sisters. Now sleep, close your eyes so that you may see. Cross the deep cold ocean into our Unbektif, our promised land. Now sleep in the Master's house, close your eyes so that you may see. Grand Sibyl Impidoc Following the instructions referenced above and throughout the various works, researchers began to discover shared dreamlike visions between unconscious persons within RPC-661. These visions were noted to grow in strength and intensity based on an individual's location inside the site. Following this discovery, Uniform-01 was tasked with the exploration of the Universal Dream, now reclassified as RPC-661-XD-N01. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.1 Department Research Date 
July 27, 19 Subject RPC-661 Authorization 2C and 2R Staff Dr. Hansik Dr. Meridak Agent Buong Test Purpose Agent Buong has been tasked with testing research personnel's new method for semi-cognitive entry in XD-N01. Once entry can be verified, Agent Buong must then actively transcribe the details of her surroundings. Begin Log Wet. The ground feels wet. I'm standing on a pier, stretching to my sides, and in front of me deep fog. Everything's wet, but there is no water anywhere near me. Behind, there is a dried, empty ocean. It is pure black with small streaks of blue, like lighting against a blackboard. This world is fuzzy. There's not enough detail where it should be. I look deeper into the fog and see a city skyline off in the distance. It looks like it could be a mile or two. I'll start heading there. Approximately thirteen seconds pass. I've made it to the city. It's huge with rooftops above and below the ground I stand on. Every corner is above one section, and below each there is another. Still farther off, I see the bell tower of Swatswald. It's bent and twisted to the side as if its neck has creased to stare at me through its window. Its eyes will not blink. His gaze penetrates the fog with unseen tangible emotion. I can't stand to look at it. The sky is full of stars, shifting and turning with the speeding clouds. The longer I look, the more faces and hands there are among the stars, shrill screaming growing louder. But as soon as I look away, they're gone, and the quiet returns. The tower is looking up like me, and the fog clears right above it. I see a black sun through the hole in the sky. An outer ring of bright fire burns around the corpse trickling somewhere beyond my sightline. An unnatural breeze can be felt, constant yet forceful. The wind sways back and forth in opposite directions. Two armies giving way to each other at the ticks of a clock. The city appears to be a mixture of Victorian and Gothic stylings, with no discernible end. Buildings like cathedrals and chapels sprout up in odd, hurtful angles. They are occupied solely by light and smoke spilling from chimneys and windows and blotting the shifting sky. Each window I look through, though, has no correlation to its outside, with its contents and orientations as erratic as the city itself. Each window is lying to me. They have no reflection, and I can't be seen. I am not alone on these streets. Shadows of shadows stalk me just out of sight. The windows have shown me where to look. I can't help but think of my reflect. End log. Mission status. Success. Immediately follow Agent Wong's recognition of her baseline self. A minus 1.5 drop in reality coherency was observed around the testing area as she returned to full consciousness. Dr. Meridak believes the coherency drop could be due to the sudden attempted reunification of the subconscious and conscious minds while on XD-N01. Containment protocols have been updated to reflect these findings. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.2 Department Research Date July 31, 19 Subject XD-N01 The subject classification was changed following Expedition 661.1's success and proving the existence of a shared conscious space. Authorization 2C and 2R Staff Dr. Isaac, Dr. Merodak, Dr. Buong. Test Purpose Agent Buong must attempt to make contact with RPC 661 1 through 364 instances, believed to reside in XD 01. Secondarily, the agent must ascertain the dangers posed by the various other entities in the dream space. Begin Log <gasps> The air is rotten, old, and putrescent. The atmosphere is thick. I can barely find my way through the miasma. A small fillet of light passes through a nearby window, revealing the outline of a building. As I make my way out of the structure, I realize it's a barn, worn by age yet standing. An antique, far past its prime with stacks of rancid grain leaking from its seams. 
My sight rises, and before me I see a titan. It rears its head against the precarious sky, posing in the shape of a city. The unnerving horizon, broken by the outlines of buildings too tall to stand, is populated by a growing discord of lights and sounds. Swatswald, yet again, stand above its peers. The corpse sun sits directly above the prolific structure, perhaps locked in place, enshrined by death. I am just on its edge, in between the woods and the arterial alleyways of the city. A lone willow looms, isolated against its siblings. Each branch reaches down around the neck of a boy, clad in robes and cages. Bodies sway slowly to the breathing beat, unmoving. Their eyes are unblinking, fixated on me, a hundred little mirrors beaming through an unstable sea. Their chests become blotched in abstract paintings, unfinished drawings, sketches, and blank pages the lower I look. I'm calling out to them, but my voice drowns in the heavy air. Filthy apostates. Still, the ones that are able to move point to the tower. A heavy gaze contorts its way from above, a crushing presence against my eyes. It looms over, his eyes seeing from the tower. On the streets again, they pulsate in a curious syncopation with the breeze. A sickening wet thud adds to the cacophony, over and over again. Rhythmic yet disordered. Soft and damp accompanied by scraping metal and a dull pounding. Whispers, low and rushed, echoes in an unnatural sense. A man, lowly and terrified, is mumbling as if to himself. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of… whose gift is this? The wages of sin is death, undeath. It is death. No. No, no, that can't be right. Faith in the Ilum is the gift. I see him now. He is just a young man, facing away from me, a member of the academy, kneeling in front of a twisted lamppost. Agent Buong pauses for several seconds. He is ramming his head against the broken iron of the post. Every plunge goes all the way through his skull and collides with the cage still fixed to his head, metal screeching in uncaring apathy. Each joust ever as forceful than the last, never breaking stride in his barely coherent ramblings. I'm calling out to him, but he doesn't appear to be able to hear me or have the wherewithal to answer. The noise won't stop, and the veil of silence keeps crumbling. The commotion is beginning to draw a crowd. A group of beasts speed past me, their porcelain figures creating a white blur. The method of their movements is unsettling to my eyes. A man in robes carrying a two-string guitar beckons me over. His face is obscured in shadow covered by a helm fashioned from a bull's skull. As quickly as he appeared he vanishes, leaving behind three queens, one old, one beautiful, and one child walking forward in a circular pattern around me. They distort rapidly beyond recognition, before ascending towards a shimmering moon beyond the woods. Several other vaguely familiar faces shoot past me, undoubtedly members of the academy. Every one of them ignores my calls. In their hands, they hold all manners of viscera, like worker ants or drones, they move hurriedly with great purpose, down alleyways and at impossible angles beyond my comprehension to see. One of the immense beasts stops to observe the murmuring student. Its sweeping spindly frame encapsulates the scene and blocks my sight, not unlike a snake encircling its meal. Its jaws quickly snap and I hear bones crack. The boy continues to mumble through his now torn neck, uncaring still. An awful gurgling overpowers the sounds of the busy street as he refuses to be silenced. The beast snaps down again, severing the boy in two at the torso. The gutter swells in bloody black ichor, enveloping the two. The entirety of the scene is washed away by coming tides, and I am alone again. The breeze grows in both strength and the frequency of its syncopations. The tower stares at me once more. It understands he sees. End log. Mission Status Success Dr. Merodak concluded testing after 4 hours and 23 minutes of exploration. Based on additional reviews of the documentation, research personnel have begun to correlate some of the entities observed with an XD-N01 with otherworldly and extra-dimensional beings documented in baseline reality. However, the lethality of the denizens of XD-N01 remains inconclusive. 
further testing with CSD personnel is being considered. Additionally, Agent Buong's review of the document has led to a curious discovery. Several uses of archaic terminology used by the agent throughout the log were unknown to her prior to entry. This may be due to a subconscious bleed-through effect directly proportional to time spent inside the dream space. Containment protocols have been updated to reflect these findings. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.3 Department Research Date August 3, 19 Subject XD-01 Authorization 3C and 3R Staff Dr. Isaac Dr. Merodak Agent Buong Test Purpose Agent Buong has been tasked with exploring the diverse structures inside XD-01. Primarily, she must attempt to reach the Swatchwald School Building and identify any additional structures with similar counterparts found within baseline reality. Begin Log The whispers of the dream fill my head, and a restful peace overtakes my body. The lifeless woods welcome me with a gentle rustling of dead branches. Eternal night blurs my vision again. The ageless fog distorts the world around me, pushing me like a branch in the river's current towards the city. Intangible forces draw me to its gaze. Cautiously I enter the city. Memories of the pale beast and the boy makes me shudder. I feel as though my thoughts are not my own now. Memories make my mind a meal a dinner bell to the Watchers, and soon I see the beast. Parasites in our holy land, looking to pilfer our feast. Who said that? I feel as though my thoughts are not my own now. The bull-faced man passes by, accompanied by another, one in a black suit. Their odd presence recenters me. As I make my way towards the deific center, the guiding lamppost shifts colors, warming the darkness and making it dance. A soft cardinal flame grips my consciousness. It lights my way towards a sunken abbey, between and beneath. The street is devoid of life, a faint silence foreshadowing her fate. As I enter, a warm reception of beautiful architecture greets me, far more beautiful than the wearisome outside. A grand library filled beyond my senses with copper and gold statues. Several floors extend above the entrance far more than could be seen from the outside, another lie. A colossal well marks the center of the foyer, adorned in a mound of corpses made of flesh and black stone. Its decaying structure contradicts the rest of the elaborate scene, faceless and unnamed. The busts and statues draw me closer with their alluring oddities each angle, and turn, bending into itself and outward. The central column rests on the back of vaguely human effigies. Their various appendages wrap around the supports, as if they were not sufficient and needed to hold the building themselves. Their arms, wings, and legs are embellished with black diamond eyes that trace my every movement. I walk deeper into a fathomless hole made itself manifest through the archive, and their features twist until they are nothing more than spheres and circles. Still accentuated by wings and eyes, but wholly alien in form. Despite the deafening silence. I can hear that I am not alone here. The books embedded between the bricks tempt me to open them. They beg and scream, their presence different from that of his gaze through the tower, but not entirely foreign. The spine of each book is devoid of any identifiable markings or descriptors, instead populated with biting eyes. I grab a large red book from one of the lower rungs of the bookcase. Each page is full of unintelligible scribbles. My eyes begin to throb with aggressive anguish as I struggle to piece together the writing. Suddenly, the markings take on a life of their own and begin to form a word. Not one that I can read, but one that transcends the page into the peripherals of my understanding. Hello? It says to me. The hair on the back of my neck stands on end at the intrusion of the word. Run, you fool! I slam the book shut and make my way towards the main door of the library. Sounds of rushing water drown out my footsteps. From outside the building, the tide comes yet again. The presence I felt inside the book flees from its rising ichor. The purging well breaks the torrent of the flood and provides me a brief respite. The abbey is gone. Its remains, the books, bust, and stone are strewn about the streets. The blood of the dream, the students, gather among the rubble. 
Suddenly, they cull the fleshy brick and stone and scurry off again, living blood opposite to that of the tree. As before, they ignore my attempts to call them. However, while I stand close to them, I see their minds. A cosmos in the eye of all of us. We are connected. They see me now, too. He sees me now. I know I am a small piece inside a great beast, unable to feel my tiny movements or perhaps apathetic to them, but now I feel its hunger, unending craving. The author of this world pangs of hunger. Dr. Meridak notes an elevated heart rate and an increase in REM sleep effects. I turn to see him, behind me, completely aware of my existence, through the sky from the tower at the academy. The windowed eye unfurls, revealing muscly sinew, and the man, it's not an eye but a mouth, fit to eat God's flesh, and I have brought his jaws down upon me, I… End log. Mission status. Failure. Agent lost. Immediately following the conclusion of Recon 661.3, Agent Vuong entered into a catatonic state. She was transferred to Site-008, where she perished after three days of intensive care. Autopsy of the body revealed the cause of death were from heart and lung failure due to swelling of the inner brain. The swelling was caused by teratoma tumors comprised of optic nerve endings on the stem of the brain. Consequently, the lethality rating of the RPC-661 has been upgraded to orange. Dr. Meridak has also concluded that testing of XD-N01 must not last longer than four hours at a time, and tests must be performed no more than once per week. Further testing documentation has been upgraded to Level 3 clearance and above. Containment protocols have been updated to reflect these findings. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.4 Department Research Date August 9, 19 Subject XD-N01 Authorization 3C and 3R Staff Dr. Hansik Dr. Meridak Agent Boucher Test Purpose Agent Boucher has been chosen as Agent Buong's replacement due to his experience as an avid lucid dreamer. He has been tasked with making contact with RPC-661-365, who is believed to reside in the Swatswald Bell Tower. Begin Log I taste the salty air. My clothes feel damp, and I am on a noxious pier. The waxing tide eases my anxious mind. The Black Sea is low, revealing its naked body. A series of ancient corpses along the ground, washed away but not forgotten, untouched by rot. Luminescent maggots slither among the various carcasses of unidentifiable creatures, eating what dissolution cannot. The woods behind me give way to the grotesque city. My neck strains to gauge the size of the monolithic cathedrals and spires, and higher still the black sun sits, waned in comparison to the growing city below. It keeps growing eating at the void around itself. The lost sun, once mighty, is a dead meal to a blind animal. Was it ever a god, or just a lion titan? His lumbering breasts and beating hearts underscored by the tower. Swatswald reaches up to the diminished repast. I am in the city now, and hardly a second has passed as I traveled. I can feel its hunger around me, an eye for the cosmos. No, a mouth in the skies. The buildings and bodies of the native cast here are as one, hundreds of voices harmonizing together, comprising the roar of the perfect beast, bodies conjoined and subdued to one will only. A section of the adjacent alleyway catches my eye. A familiar mix of clean grays and whites conspicuously blends with its surroundings. Textless signs appear as I remember them. Site 002? Not a doubt in my mind as I cautiously traverse the alleyway's contents quickly shifting from rock and wood to metal. Her voice bleeds into my mind momentarily. A sleeping colleague. I remember? I bend my will against the curiosity before me, as I must not let it devour me. My goal still looms overhead. Swatswald. My destination is the mouth of this world, so I follow its breath. The wind pushing and pulling its way to the apex guides me. The world shifts around me a perjurer to my ambition. I challenge the egregore and make myself seen. The path attempts to lead me to ruin, to the stomach, to the bones of its foundation. I press forward still. 
the breeze becomes a black downpour at the base, accompanied by Esker rain. The gutters of the streets are vast as rivers, scattered by over blood and bile. The tower itself extends far beyond my capacity to see at such proximity. The simple sight of it gives me conniptions. I cast my view downward as I reach for the door. As my fingers brush the ornate embossing, I surge with revelation. The tower hides behind a fleshy coat, not of its own making, but as a new face. It is a sunken anchor here, the cornerstone of this world, and yet the icor of his deceit. He eats away at it, unwilling to acknowledge the ebbing of its footing. I cast open the doors and enter the main hall, except it is unrecognizable to me now. A barren antique stone structure with stairs leading both up and down. Streaks of parasitic veins run from the entryway, reaching to the floors below, fracturing an endemic base. The wild flood lays stagnant on the floor, high enough to hide my lower legs from me. It flows freely from the ceiling and the upper stairwell. Fully aware, he floods the lower levels, an audacious invitation upwards. I pray my keepers to prepare their efforts to rest me from this nightmare. The morning sun, I do not know what host will stand before me. His unified wills rest atop this ilum. I parallel his ascension in only the most minute manners. Can this be a man anymore? I pass quickly upward still, struggling to ignore the host of visions each floor offers me. A group of phantoms brandishing the triangle, wishing to understand the nature of eyes, spirals hopelessly against the infinite, only several stages up. They are a picture painted a thousand times over, with only the slightest variations. Some of them adorn themselves in blue capes, others are fleeing a burning world, yet others still press onwards in the pursuit of untold knowledge. I am one of them, varied only slightly by my host's gracious call. Dr. Meridak prepares a syringe of epinephrine at the believed request of Agent Boucher. On-site medical personnel have suggested that a potent stimulant may resuscitate subject immediately following their entry into a catatonic state. Higher still, I enter a floor covered in a red mist. The sound of beating wings fills the air. I strain to see the allery creature before me, but my focus shifts as the ground beneath me begins to crack and wane. I flee from the rampant destruction beneath me, only just making my way to the stairwell as the floor buckles and breaks. Impatient of my time here, he opens the passageway past the never-ending floors. I just make it to his archway as a deafening crash is heard below. The red fog turns to a burning blue as I slam the door shut behind me. I now stand at the foyer of the Sepulchre of Impidoc, his name no more. Hordes of faithful disciples prostrate themselves before the Torrid. They are a mix of students of the Academy, phantoms from below and weak spirits to lowly even to become part of the body of the dream. Their foreheads touch the floor, creating pools of the veiny flood from below. They are like an arm stretching beneath the archway towards their sovereign lord. I enter the precipice. In the center of the room stands a man. The eye of the nightmare sees all from here. It is unchallenged. Streaks from the dead sun leak through the roof and leach into the floor. They move past the stagnant waters that plague this incubus. Does he notice me? Glory be to he, the new god. His head is wrapped in bandages, old wounds and stained dressings. The swelling of his mind presses against his headpiece. Vestigial mouths and eyes wrap around the copper bars, corroding their restraints. The pupils of the eyes split again and again until they are like stars. Several vertical rungs burst upward from his girth, forming what appears to be a cracked crown. The nature of his being contorts. Frail extensions of the arms, fingers, and torso make him a polypheme. Still unable to control the eyes, he turns to me with a gaze so dominant I fall to my knees before him. He slithers his way towards me. The lower end of his stomach distends into a black, pustular tumor, with bones and wet, sickly growths extending past its form. The perversion of the snake, a slug, blasphemy. Agent Boucher begins to experience an intense increase in rim effects. Dr. Meridak injects him with the epinephrine. I cannot be here. The voices of thousands enter my head, the chorus led by the mouth and eye. Their presence is so heavy my features turn in on themselves, 
as if the individual points of my being sense the looming demise. My footing is adrift in the Icor, and I am a meal to him, another brick in the new world. He knows I wake. The corpse of the Black Sun sees my blight. Within his visage, there is a true world. The morning light breaks the eternal night. Interloper, and I have been whisked away. End log. Mission Stas Success Agent Boucher's speech mannerisms vary sporadically from his baseline self immediately following his entry into the dream space. Dr. Meridak has theorized that distinct individuals may be more susceptible to the bleed-through subconscious effects of XD-01, or that its effects are growing in strength and intensity. All subsequent testing of RPC-661-XD-01 has been disbanded following Recon 661.4. Due to its supposed ability to assimilate the minds of its inhabitants, Authority personnel categorized it as a possible Class V higher dimensional entity. See Addendum 661-03 for further details. Warning: The following file is restricted to Level 4 personnel. The continuation of this document has been restricted to Level 4 personnel and above by the order of Dr. Mason of Site-074. Personnel caught accessing this document without proper authorization may be subjected to immediate apprehension and administered A2 amnestics. You have been warned. Addendum 661-03 Incident 66101-N01 Following the ban on anomaly experimentation with an XD-N01, Uniform 01's Agent Boucher have been reassigned to various other anomalies within the northern United States. Approximately two months after his expedition into the dream space, on September 22, 19, Authority personnel intercepted a distress call from Agent Boucher's personal radio. After initially failing to make contact with the agent, a recovery team was dispatched to his last known location. Incident Report 66101-N01 Recovery teams were dispatched to the Hotel in New York following Boucher's distress call. The hotel staff have received several noise complaints involving screaming and various other nondescript noises prior to the authorities' intervention. Once in his room, recovery teams discovered the agent's body among several info-hazardous inscriptions. Catalogued below are some of the recovered notes found alongside the inscriptions. I have been pulled in again, back to this nightmare, back to the Holy Land. I know I am not in the waking world, but I am unable to control any aspect of my dream. Helplessly, I play the familiar role of the scribe. Swatswald. He is bent down almost kneeling to see me. Info had her to symbol omitted. How has he found me here? He is weaker than in the school, but I am dwarfed by comparison. The world wraps around itself so that I cannot escape. I hear the prayers of his congregation overpowering my thoughts, yet I am not alone. Other travelers, new to this world are beside me, pulled below the ocean of black, down into the stomach. He stops. He recognizes me from before. Silent and blind, he lets me struggle. I am nothing to his holy presence. My will is nothing as his mute voice wraps around the inside of my skull. I must atone for my sins. Atone! Empo had her symbol omitted. He knows now what I know, and as I join the congregation below, and sets his eyes on the three pillars, the sky is now full of husks, black suns to act as our feast. Let the feast begin! Various other inscriptions could be found on the walls of the room and inside the pages of the Nightstand's Bible. These inscriptions are currently indecipherable based on the condition of the writing and the language of the text. Autopsy of the body revealed a cause of death similar to Agent Vuong's. However, Agent Boucher had inoculated his eyes at some point during the incident. Due to the events of Incident 66101-N01, X-Ray-06 began monitoring reports of other sleep-related deaths on the night of September 22, 19. They discovered an increase of approximately 1,000% of SADS and SIDS cases at the time of the incident. Standard case study rates did not appear to normalize for another 13 days following the event. Reclassification of RPC-661 to Omega Red is currently pending approval.
Registered Phenomena Code 202 Object Class Alpha White Explained Additional Properties Extradimensional Containment Protocols The original RPC-202 documents are to be stored within standard high-value item containment, accessible only with clearance from the Site Director. Copies of RPC-202 may be distributed by the Head Researcher. Description. RPC-202 is the collective designation for five paper documents, originating from the alternate reality ALTR-C44X. The documents manifested within Site-044, each appearing in different places throughout the facility. An eyewitness described one of these events as, quote, a sudden flash of blue light, lasting only a few seconds. Everything then returned to normal, except a piece of paper was now on the floor. The documents were collected and analyzed. Through the use of an anderson eckert coherency test, it was deduced that upon discovery, the documents had a coherency level of approximately 4.67. However, over the course of several days, this coherency decreased until RPC-202 reached an equilibrium with that of our own reality at 3.97. RPC-202 are otherwise non-anomalous. The contents of RPC-202 consist of various log entries, a video transcription, a report from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and a printed letter written by a researcher of an authority equivalent within ALTR-C44X. Each document in some way relates to a Zeta-7 baseline coherency disturbance scenario, in which a significant disruption in the Anderson constant occurred. A transcription of each RPC-202 document is available below. Document RPC-202-1 These log entries came printed on a single sheet of paper, no preface given. Log Entry 1 Over the last few days, we have gotten reports from Authority researchers specializing in the study of ACS levels that there has been some kind of shift in the baseline coherency level. Study into this will begin shortly. Log Entry 2 We've been able to verify that there has been some kind of coherency shift. We are not yet certain as to its magnitude, or the area it affects. This warrants extensive study. Log Entry 3 There is a noticeable change in the circulation of air particles. Weather patterns have become easier to track and predict. It seems that there is simply more information that can be obtained through standard weather observation devices. Log Entry 4 After extensive testing, we have discerned that the entirety of the planet has increased by an ACS level of 0.1. The sheer scope of this change is incredibly unnerving. We have also been able to detect differences and fluctuations of coherency within different regions. Some locations appear to have increased in coherency by a higher degree, or are continuing to increase despite most regions having ceased at this point. As of yet, we have not been able to discern any possible cause for the coherency abnormalities. Log Entry 5 We were wrong in our assumption that most regions have ceased their increase in coherency level. It seems that the baseline coherency level of most of the planet if not all of it, is increasing at a rate of 0.1 every three months. Currently, we are at a baseline coherency level of 4.2, the original level being roughly 3.97. Log Entry 6 We've noticed several locations have increased in coherency by extreme amounts. A small town in Oregon was observed to have increased from a coherency of 4.21 to 4.73 over the course of three days. The residents of the town evacuated, traveling to a nearby town. However, none of them were still alive after two weeks. They had all developed mental derangement. The majority of the subjects died due to suicide. An investigation team equipped with perception-dampening suiting was sent to the location. One member described the town as, quote, incredibly formation-dense as if I could pick out the tiniest of detail with ease. I recall seeing an abandoned newspaper stand, and read every single headline within only a few seconds." Unquote. 
The team did not suffer any lasting effects following the investigation. Log Entry 7 The baseline coherency of most regions have reached 4.3. Changes in our reality caused by the rise in coherency have become apparent. The world seems to make more sense now. It is much easier to understand things without human fallacies getting in the way. Furthermore, information in general has become more noticeable. Little details seem to present themselves. It can feel a bit mentally burdensome at times. Document RPC-202-2 Head Researcher Gerso I'd like to formally request a transfer from the project. As much as I want to help you in this, I can't keep going. It's too painful. Handling these high-coherency objects has made my mind hazy. I fear that I am on the verge of crossing over a threshold, my mind becoming unstable. I've been seeing things out of the corners of my eyes. Eldritch beasts lurking over my shoulders, gone the moment I turned my head. One day after work, I was walking along the street to my car before feeling something behind me. I turned my head slightly to the left, trying to discreetly see what was there. I saw a tall, featureless figure, a faceless head with gray wrinkled skin just above my shoulder. I kept my composure and continued to walk. It followed with steps in sync with my own, always staying at exactly the same distance behind me. It emanated a deep, static-like noise. I could feel my heart throbbing in my chest. After what felt like an eternity, I reached my car. I opened the car door, stepped inside and closed it. As I prepared to drive, I kept my eyes away from the entity. It pressed its head up to the side window, just close enough without touching the glass. As I drove away, I saw it in my side view mirror. It stood there with its head pointed towards me, as if it had eyes to see me. I impulsively turned my head to look at it with my own eyes, and it was gone. The scary part is I don't think I was hallucinating, I think it was real. These things were always there, but I did not have the capacity to comprehend them. I hope that my mind can return to ease if I leave the project now. I can only hope. Dr. Bentham Document RPC-202-3 Log Entry 8 The Coherency Department of Site-099, our primary lunar base, has alerted us that they have detected minor abnormalities in coherency levels as well. They will be performing an extended diagnostic test in order to determine the full extent of these abnormalities. A request to the International Space Station to perform similar testing has also been made. Log Entry 9 We have received test results from Site-099 and the ISS. After reviewing the notes, we can conclude that coherency disturbances are not localized to Earth. Document RPC-202-4 Notice: This is an official report from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration (NASA) informing the authority of abnormal signals being received from the Voyager 1 space probe. Over the last seven days, transmissions suggest fluctuations in the behavior of electromagnetic radiation emanating from the Sun. Through extensive study and analysis of the data, we have determined that the Voyager 1 probe, the Sun, and several planets are increasing in coherency, suggesting that the scope of this coherency shift extends far beyond the Earth. Furthermore, the Voyager 1 probe is increasing in coherency at exactly the same rate as the Earth. Assuming there is a natural falloff, this would imply that either the affected area of space is extremely vast, at least the size of the Milky Way galaxy, or that the entire universe is the subject of this coherency shift. In any case, it is extremely probable that the cause of this coherency shift is extraterrestrial in nature. Document RPC-202-5 Transcription D-332 Note, Site-066 and an approximate 30 km radius of area surrounding it have been compromised, having increased the coherency level from 4.4 to 5.2. A single video and audio feed was recovered from an on-site security camera situated within the hallway opposite of Research Block B. The event lasted roughly 34 minutes. Begin Log 0 seconds to 35 seconds
No apparent deviation from baseline coherency. Researchers are visible traversing the hallway as normal. 35 seconds to 2 minutes 12 seconds. There are minor fluctuations in the lighting of the hallway. The edges of shadows within the room become clearer. Although somewhat contradictory, they remain at the same level of blurriness. 2 minutes 12 seconds to 4 minutes 55 seconds. The walls of the hallway begin to change in texture, seeming to become more detailed. Minor crevices and extrusions become more apparent, despite not changing in physical form. A researcher passing through the hallway is noticeably uneasy. 4 minutes 55 seconds to 8 minutes 32 seconds. All surfaces within the hallway become more and more enhanced over several minutes. The audio feed becomes more coherent. Individual sounds become more individually identifiable. Audio originating from nearby rooms within the site are becoming noticeable. 8 minutes 32 seconds to 12 minutes 11 seconds. A low rustling can be heard, believed to be ambient noise within the facility. In the distance, the sound of a coffee machine whirring can be heard in vivid detail. Muffled discussion between researchers in different rooms is audible, slowly becoming more coherent until each conversation can be heard. These conversations, footsteps, writing on paper, breathing, and a multitude of other minuscule noises can all be heard and understood individually, in an excruciating detail despite being overlapped within one audio feed. 12 minutes 11 seconds to 12 minutes 45 seconds. The hallway appears vivid. Microscopic cracks in the floor tiles of the room are striking. A slight vibration in the lens of the camera, caused by the flow of air through the facility, is indisputable. This substantial, growing amount of information is disturbing and discomforting. Audio throughout the entire facility is now apparent. Outside the facility is the sound of grass swaying through the wind, leaves falling from trees, birds flapping their wings, beetles burrowing into the dirt, water trickling down small streams. The rubbing together of individual particles of dirt. Each pebble, grain of sand, fleck of dust, thousands, millions, billions of minuscule items, each sensed and understood. 12 minutes 45 seconds to 13 minutes 5 seconds. Personnel within the facility leave their rooms and enter the hallway. Every movement, every muscle twitch, every breath taken, clothes folding, skin stretching, skin creasing. Every insignificant amount of hair and fingernail growth. The pulse of each person's heartbeat through the blood vessels in their eyes. Flexing of ligaments and tendons. Every minimal jitter and pupil dilation. All revealing in tremendous distinction the intense, inconceivable distress, confusion, and immense suffering each person is experiencing. My senses are engulfed, never-ending. Individual bacterium traversing elegantly through space. Organelles processing proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates in beautiful symphony. 13 minutes 5 seconds to 21 minutes 2 seconds. Pain screaming is heard throughout the facility. Every annotation and undulation. I hear a pistol being loaded in the opposite side of the building. The entire scene comprehensible and full. A man breathes chaotically fingers locking as he puts the gun to his head. He pulls the trigger. A series of interlocking mechanical components move, interwoven in perfect harmony, as gunpowder ignites and a bullet is released, entering the man's head through the bottom of his jaw, passing through layers of bone, skin, and brain matter, before exiting through the back of his head. He falls to the ground, a thousand individual drops of blood hitting the wall converging into a thick, uniform substance as it trails down to the floor, congealing at the bottom. A woman steps in the pool of liquid while running towards the nearest exit. She trips, plummeting towards the floor before reflexively extending her arms to the ground. She pushes herself back up and continues, reaching the exit and escaping to outside the facility. After several minutes of running, she falls to the ground, unable to escape her own mind. The vibration of every single molecule, atom, and elementary particle. An uncountable, vast field of information, filling the pores of my mind. It doesn't end. An everlasting waterfall invading my thoughts. 
it never ends. A web of organized chaos. Pure, unadulterated static, growing louder, louder, ever louder. It overwhelms me. I think, but I do not hear my own thoughts. Time is not a concept. I type, but I do not feel my own fingers. I… I can't. There's nothing to hold on to. I'm drowning in the confines of my own mind. Please. I beg. I can't. Please. End log. Note, Researcher Maillard, the person responsible for transcribing his log, has entered a comatose state following his observing of the camera and audio feeds. Attempting to continue the transcription for the remaining ten minutes of the recording had been disallowed. None of the individuals present within the facility were able to survive the event. The ones that did not commit suicide died due to significant brain damage caused by the rupturing of blood vessels and extreme swelling. Addendum. Through extended analysis of the original RPC-202 documents, traces of a reality signature have been found. By corroborating these traces, a complete signature has been obtained, allowing the authority to locate ALTR-C44X. Mobile Specialized Team Uniform 1, through God's Eyes, an MST specialized in missions relating to objects and environments of very high or low coherency, was tasked with entering and investigating ALTR-C44X. The team entered equipped with coherency stabilizing suiting, capable of maintaining a safe internal coherency. A recording of the investigation was created, using filtered cameras and microphones that simplify a high coherency input into a baseline coherency output. This recording is transcribed below. Investigation Log Investigation Log 202.1 Date Team Mobile Specialized Team Uniform 1 Through God's Eyes Captain U-1 Cap Inglo Members U-1-1 Burikov U-1-2 Mbibwe Forward Due to the complication of cross-universal travel, Uniform 1 did not have a line of communication with Site Command during the investigation. U-1-2 came equipped with an Anderson Eckhart coherent U-1-2 came equipped with an Anderson Eckhart coherency reader AECR, and a reality signature module capable of determining the exact location of RPC-202's origin. Begin log. Uniform 1 enters into a dense urban environment. It is very quiet, only the sound of a soft wind audible on the recording. There are no humans immediately visible, living or not. The carcasses of squirrels and other small animals are scattered across the road and sidewalk. Dozens of stationary, abandoned vehicles are in the road. Vines and other flora cover the buildings. Video and audio feeds have minor irregularities caused by the high coherency level and simplification filters. Tall grass sprouting out of cracks in the concrete pavement appears to sway in the wind in an unnatural fashion, moving in disjointed clusters that do not resemble realistic wind patterns. The sky appears to flicker between a soft blue and a slightly greener hue. The team verifies that all equipment and recording devices are functional before beginning with the mission. First things first, you want to. We need an ACS reading and a geographic location. U-1-2 unfolds an AECR and places it on the ground. After a moment, it releases a flash of light. U-1-2 looks at its display before recompacting it. The coherency level is somewhere between 5 and 6. That's as accurate as I could get. Also, this is New York City. I don't need to run a test for that. I used to live in NYC. This is pretty crazy. Highest coherency environment I've been in. Everything looks like… plastic? That's not even close to describing it with words, but it's the best I got. Another thing. What direction is the point of origin for the reality signature? It's uh, northish from here. Going along this road should get us there. We've got a few blocks up to go. The team travels along the road for several minutes, before stopping to investigate a human corpse inside of a small eatery. U-11, 
enter the building and report anything of note. U-11 walks into the room. There is a single body resting on the inside of a booth. The corpse is partially decomposed. Dried blood is visible in streaks flowing from the ears, eyes, and nostrils, pulling on the table. There is blood dripping out of his orifices. Probably died due to coherency rise. Other than that, nothing of note here. Let's move on. Uniform 1 travels for roughly four minutes before reaching an intersection. The approximate destination. This should be about it. Strange. There's nothing here. Wait. I've been here before. What? How? Well, not here, here. I've been to this place at our home dimension. The entrance to Site 044 is right around here. Site 044? Isn't that where the 202 docks came into our universe? Yeah. It's a subterranean site? It should be about a kilometer right below us. I know the facility like the back of my hand. I used to be stationed here on the ASF. That was a few years ago. It would definitely be great if you could help with navigation. But certainly there could have been some renovating since you left the ASF. Knowing the Authority, probably not. Fucking bureaucrats. Heh, <laughs> nice. So, where's the entrance? In there, there are stairs that go from the top to the bottom of the building. At the bottom of the stairwell, there's a keypad locked door into Site 044. They change the code every few weeks, so I wouldn't know. We'll have to bust in. There's probably no one left alive in there to stop us anyway. Uniform 1 travels into the office building, entering a lounge area. It is barren with no signs of life. There is no electricity throughout the building. The stairwell is visible beside an open elevator shaft. The team travels down the stairwell, reaching an unmarked metal door with a keypad. The door is slightly open, a viscous blue liquid covering the door frame, locking it in place. The door is already open. Everyone stand back. U-11 investigate. U-1-1 approaches the door and examines the liquid. It seems to vibrate very slightly, oscillating back and forth at a minuscule degree. It is otherwise inert. Probably residue from something that left the facility. Seems harmless. Uniform 1 passed through the doorway into an entrance lobby. At the center is a receptionist's desk with a computer and several stacks of papers. There is a single doorway on the left side of the room, leading into the rest of the facility. The blue liquid is seen trailing from the entrance doorway, along the wall and into an air vent. After checking the area for threats, the team investigate the reception desk. The computer does not have electricity. The papers do not have any valuable information on them. You'll want to. What direction is the reality signature origin? It seems to be several meters below us. The facility has two floors. We'll need to travel through a hallway or two. Alright. U-11, guide us as we go. The team travel through the doorway into a lengthy hallway. They travel to the end in a triangular formation, look into each adjacent room. The majority of them are basic research labs without anything of note. Within the second to last room on the left, the body of an unidentified male researcher lay on the floor, a bullet wound in his skull. Blood and gore is splattered across the floor. A gun is visible beside his right hand. Once at the end of the hallway, Uniform 1 reaches the flight of stairs. As they descend to the next floor, a noise is heard, the low rumble of an unidentifiable entity pacing back and forth, speaking to itself in a low, unintelligible murmur. As the team continue and reach the bottom of the stairs, the noise grows louder. At the bottom of the stairs is a hallway similar to the first except with thick steel doors. There are ten doors in total, five on each side of the hallway. Three of these doors have small glass windows. The rumbling noise seems to be originating from the room on the right side of the very end of the hallway. No other noises are audible. The unknown blue liquid is visible dripping from a ventilation grill in the corner of the room. However, none of Uniform 1 notice. Uniform 1 approaches the end of the hallway, checking each door as they travel. 
Within the first room on the left is the corpse of a pale woman with a small infant's doll in her hands. The room is labeled RPC-480. The first room on the right does not have a window and does not have a label. As the team continue, the sound becomes more audible. It is the sound of an unknown human male walking in circles within the chamber, mumbling to himself. The second room on the left contains four large wooden crates filled with assorted bottles of vibrantly colored liquids. The room is labeled RPC-909. The second room on the right does not have a window. The room is labeled RPC-126. Uniform 1 have approached close enough to make out some of what the person is saying. No. No, I can't. It isn't right. I need to think. <laughs> the third room on the left does not have a window, and does not have a label. Within the third room on the right is the corpse of a male researcher who died of unclear causes. His hands are on the back of his head having pulled a hair from his scalp. At the center of the room is a large metal box, characters strewn across the floor. The room is labeled RPC-599. How long has it been? I keep losing count. How many days? It must be at least thirty, less than a year. I don't… How long was that? The fourth room on the left does not have a window. The room does not have a label. The fourth room on the right does not have a window. The room is labeled RPC-130. Inside the last room on the left is a large vintage slot machine with the words, Lucky Louie's Casino Customs, printed in bright letters at the top. The machine's display shows three reels, each of the bright number seven. The door to this room was left open, unlike the rest of the rooms. The room is labeled RPC-777. The right room has no window and is unlabeled. The sound is originating from this room. I, I don't know. What do I even do? I just, uh, I just don't. How much food do I have left? I need to check. What if it's low? Okay. Okay, it's not low. But what if it was? I need to know what would I do if it was. It will be eventually. I need to know what to do. What will I do? What will I do? What, what will I do? What will I do? That's the question. I need an answer. There's no one here to answer it. I need someone to answer it. I have to answer it. But what is the answer? I don't know. What's the answer? What is it? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I don't know. I, I just don't. U1 Cap motions to U12 to check the reality signature module. He does and points at the doorway, signifying that the origin is directly within the room. Oh shit. What if I'm low on water? I need to check. I can't be low on water. Not now. Not now. Okay. I'm not low on water. I'm not. I have enough water. I have enough food. I'm not low on water. U1 Cap signals U1-2 and U1-1 to stand back as he carefully approaches the door, not making a sound. He puts his hand on the door handle and attempts to open the door, but a large object is blocking the door from being opened. Hello? Hello, is, some, is someone there? You one cap remains silent. My mind's playing tricks on me again. Why does it do this? Why? Why? I'm paranoid, Garso. Shut the fuck up. You're paranoid. L listen to yourself. Fuck, 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 fuck. The man stops talking for a brief moment. No, 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 my mind is not playing tricks on me. No, I refuse to believe- Hello? Is someone there? Spawn, damn it, P please. Please. <laughs> I've been here for so long. I can't take it. Please, they have to be here. They have to have gotten my message. It's the only way. Hello? What? What? Are you real or are you just a figment of my mind? Why does my mind do this? Why? 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 Why?
I assure you, I am real. We received your message. Holy fuck! Shit, fuck! Actually fucking work? Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. I have something. I have something for this. I have a suit. Sir, please calm down. I need you to explain to me who you are and everything you know. No, 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 I can't think. We need to leave. Everything is too clear. I can't take it. I have a suit for this. It will protect me. Just, just take me back with you. My mind needs low coherency. It can't function. The suit protects my mind. Okay, just come out of the room. After several minutes, the chamber door opens. The man is visible inside a suit composed of clunky metal components. Let's fucking go! Listen, we have protocols to follow. Hold on. You're too slow. I'll lead the way. The man sprints out of the facility. God damn it. Uniform 1 follows behind him. Once they reach the surface, U-1-2 activates the return portal and they travel through. Upon arrival, the unidentified individual is tranquilized. End log. Closing statement. The unknown individual is later identified as Dr. Garso. A former authority researcher from ALTR-C44X. Following the investigation, he had been kept in standard humanoid containment for several days before he began to regain mental stability. It is believed that the high coherency environment caused Dr. Garso's hysteria. An interview with Dr. Garso took place. See Interview Log 202.1. Once Uniform 1 returned, the recordings were analyzed and studied. After exiting Site-044, a trail of the unknown blue substance was visible in several locations that had previously not been observed. Seven days following the investigation, a pool of the substance was found at the location of re-entry within our own universe. Analysis of the substance is currently underway. Interview Log 202.1 Interviewed Dr. Garceau Interviewer Dr. Richards Forward. This is the first formal questioning of Dr. Garceau and the events pertaining to ALTR-C44X. Begin log. First of all, how are you feeling, Dr. Garceau? Like shit. I'm still recovering from everything. My mind's still a bit jittery. I just want to make it through this interview and go back to my quarters. That's alright. Just try to answer every question with as much possible detail as you can. Whatever gets me through this interview. So, could you provide a general overview as to explain in the circumstances surrounding your home universe and that of RPC-202? Am I safe to work under the assumption that you've read all of the documents I sent through? Uh, yes. I don't know where to start. My head's all over the place. Would it be alright if I asked some specific questions? Yeah, that should be fine. Let's see. What caused the coherency shift described in the 202 documents? We never even came close to finding a cause. The only thing we could deduce was that it was too abrupt to be a natural force of the universe, at least not entirely. My theory is that something caused a disturbance, which then caused the entire universe to be unstable. The universe then shredded towards some form of stability, which I suppose would be a higher coherency level for some reason. Not really sure why that would be more stable, but Dr. Bentham coined the term ACS entropy to describe the phenomena. Of course, this is all just theory. Is this the same Dr. Bentham that had sent the letter from one of the 202 documents? Oh, I forgot I sent that with the other documents. Yes, him. Could you explain what role he played in these events? Dr. Garso? I'm sorry. He was very important to me. I, I don't know what happened to him. I can only assume the worst. Why was he important to you? He was the closest thing to family I had. 
He's my lab assistant in title, but was practically my equal. I see. I'd like to move on to a different topic. Perfectly understandable. We can return to this at a later time. Thank you. How were you able to send the RPC-202 documents over to our reality? Long before the coherency shift began, I was the head researcher for Project Portal, an endeavor to research interdimensional travel. That project was a money hole, sucking up a fuck ton of resources. Project Portal was completed in our timeline. That was how we were able to reach you. I was the head researcher for the project. Oh, do I exist within your timeline? Not an... Not anymore, unfortunately. There was a, a tragic accident during the project, Event Zero. I've heard of no event by that name from my timeline, nor do I ever recall anyone with your name. In my timeline, I sadly did not know you very well. You had just joined the project shortly before you were lost. Our timelines must have diverged at some point before that. In my universe, Project Portal was put on a halt indefinitely. And I was transferred to be head researcher of the coherency shift stuff. The authority began to break down due to the rise in coherency. Everyone around me was going insane. I think I have a naturally resistant mind to the effects of a high coherency environment. I considered suicide but decided against it. I had to do something, anything, whatever could possibly undo the damage. Were you not affected by the coherency shift? Of course I was affected, but not nearly as much as my co-workers. Eventually at least a dozen of them had committed suicide. At that point I focused all my efforts on finding a way to save myself so that I could continue researching the shift. To answer your question. Sending those documents was a last-ditch effort. I would have sent a written note, but it had become impossible for my mind to write a coherent message. After months of failure, I figured my best bet would be to seek help. I was right in assuming that you would be able to reverse engineer a reality signature, but I expected this authority to be a lot more advanced. It seems that you have just as little understanding of the events of my universe as myself. I I don't know what to do at this point. I think I've lost. I I simply don't know what to say. If it's all right with you, I'd like to return to my quarters now. I need rest. I think that would be me perfectly fine. Please have your rest. End log. Closing statement. Following the interview, Dr. Garceau returned to his quarters and attempted to commit suicide through self-strangulation. After approximately 40 seconds, an ASF member entered the room and intervened. Dr. Garceau was admitted to the medical center for care. Interview Log 202.2 .2. Interviewed Dr. Garceau Interviewer Dr. Richards Forward Following Dr. Garceau's suicide attempt and subsequent time within the medical center, a second interview was held. Begin log. I'm... I'm sorry. Please be at ease, Doctor. I don't think I can. Take a deep breath. <sighs> it's too early to give up now. Why? There's no hope left. This reality was my last chance. And it's nothing like what I was hoping for. It's just the same. What if I told you that this authority, in all of its power and resources, is going to do everything in its capacity to help you? <laughs> I'd call you a liar. I've worked for the authority most of my life. I know how they operate. They wouldn't lift a finger for one man from a reality that doesn't matter to them. They're an infinite amount of alternate realities. Helping one in need would mean having to help them all. 
they only look out for themselves, which isn't evil. It would be unrealistic to do otherwise. Researching the events of your universe is imperative to ensuring the safety of our own. What do you mean? Picture this and think about it. Out of fucking nowhere, with no clear cause, your universe goes straight to hell in only a matter of weeks. Who's to say that this couldn't happen to our universe? As such, we have to study your universe, first in hopes to prevent this from happening within our very own. And with any luck, we may even find a way to save yours in the process. <sighs> You're right. Now I need to ask you something very important. Oh. Go ahead. What do you know about a viscous blue liquid? A what? I know nothing of this. It was found within your universe and came back with Uniform-1. Analysis has come to show that its reality signatures are completely different from that of either reality. God. Could that be it? Please, Doctor, help us. With your knowledge, you can be a great asset to our research. I have to. This is it. This has to be. End log. Closing statement. Dr. Garso is now working as a researcher on Project Blue, an operation with the goal to research and study the events of ALTR-C44X and the substance acquired during the investigation. Registered Phenomena Code 848 Object Class Beta White Utility Hazard Types Ecological Hazard Grouped Hazard Organic Hazard Contact Hazard Destabilization Hazard Extradimensional Hazard Teleportation Hazard Containment Protocols OL Site-042 has been established surrounding RPC-848 for the purpose of observation and protection. In case of an attack on RPC-848 or a breach of OL Site-042, ASF units must terminate all hostiles. All Authority operatives who are stationed on other planes of existence must prioritize the defense of this universe's corresponding instance of RPC-848-1. Operatives stationed in other realities must always liaise with this reality, and must never attempt to make contact with an alternate reality authority counterpart. All on-site personnel must liaise with the gardeners of RPC-848 if they wish to traverse the anomaly. When traversing RPC-848, personnel may only make contact with the instance of RPC-848-1 or RPC-848-2 if under direct orders to travel the said instance's corresponding plane of existence. Unauthorized traversal of RPC-848 or handling of floral specimens will result in termination. Each RPC-848-1 and RPC-848-2 instance, from the instance's appearances as well as its corresponding plane of existence, are to be recorded and catalogued in document AR-114. Description. In this universe, RPC-848 is the designation for a plot of land located on the Norwegian-Swedish border in National Park, measuring approximately 5 hectares by 7 hectares. RPC-848 is distinguishable from the surrounding area, in that all plant species within it are non-native, from the grass to the instances of RPC-848-1 and RPC-848-2. Even the soil composition is different. RPC-848 has its own biosphere, and as such, it is completely independent of the surrounding land, in terms of its ecosystem. RPC-848-1 instances are tree-like organisms, resembling members of the genus Fraxinus, which have been discovered to be a part of a clonal colony. A clonal colony is a group of genetically identical individuals, such as plants, fungi, or bacteria 
that have grown in a given location, which all share a singular root system. There are various other plant species within RPC-848, which have been broadly designated RPC-848-2, as they all share a common anomalous trait along with RPC-848-1. When direct contact is made with a specimen within RPC-848, they will be perceived as spheroidal constructs, containing various galaxies, nebulae, and other celestial bodies. After contact with an instance is made, the subject will proceed to speak in an unidentifiable language, which has been determined to be most similar to… When subjects commence speaking this language, it has always been reported to have a tone and pacing akin to chanting. No individual has been able to remember what or if they said anything at all. As subjects chant, a spatial anomaly begins to form near the subject, after which they will be drawn into it. These space-time anomalies, when explored, will lead subjects to various alternate realities depending upon the instance of RPC-848-1. This only happens with RPC-848-1 instances. Realities accessed via RPC-848-1 have been confirmed as being true alternate realities, as testing with the Authority's own method or interdimensional travel will lead subjects to the same reality as accessed via an RPC-848-1 instance, through the matching of the reality signature. Instances of RPC-848-2, when their corresponding plane of existence is accessed, are known to be highly different from a typical alternate reality accessed via an instance of RPC-848-1. These planes of existence have generally been discovered to not be universes in the traditional sense and are instead classified as an unnatural, artificial, or other reality, acronymized to UAO. A partial catalog of UAO realities accessed via RPC-848-2 instances, as well as alternate realities encountered via RPC-848-1 instances, can be found in Addendum 848-1. Several humanoids have been seen roaming seemingly at random throughout RPC-848. These beings will attest that they are the gardeners of RPC-848. This is unconfirmed, as they do not perform typical plant nursery maintenance. Instead, they have been documented uprooting several RPC-848-2 instances, as well as cases where RPC-848-1 instances, numbering from one to dozens of instances, were chopped down, with all gardeners broadly claiming said instances to be invasive or unhealthy without any elaboration. Further information on these gardeners can be found in Interview 848-1. Addendum 848-1 Catalog of alternate-slash-UAO realities accessed via instances of RPC-848-1 and RPC-848-2. Below is a partial document of realities encountered through RPC-848. Full documentation of the catalog can be found in Document AR-114. RPC-848-1 Instance Designation Reality Description Notes RPC-848-1-1Q7-55J-11 This designation is also given to the corresponding alternate reality slash plane of existence. Reality determined to be similar to baseline. However, the RPC Authority appears to be a public sector organization. This authority equivalent began operations during the Reformation, when their equivalent Octoritas Impertus became fully independent from the Catholic Church, expanding throughout Europe and eventually all over the world. This authority equivalent fully embraces their role as a public sector organization, holding many charity events for help with funding for containment of anomalies, as well as incorporating anomalous education into Common Core schooling. Let's never do this, Dr. Quincy. RPC-848-1-2D4-47K-01 Reality is that of Earth or an Earth-like planet with a multitude of moons in its orbit. Said moons cause severe tidal forces across the planet, which in turn cause gravity within tidal force-affected areas to be highly variable. Life on the planet seems to have adapted in many ways to combat these tidal forces, with some becoming entirely dependent on them. Caution is advised when traversing this reality, as said tidal forces are great enough to tear objects apart. RPC-848-1-7Y4-13R-217 Reality Description 
Reality is that of two Earth-like planets, which are twin planets, in that both are roughly equal in diameter, orbit on the same plane about their star, and both have separate and equal opposing gravitational pulls. This causes objects from one particular planet to be completely insusceptible to the gravity of the other planet, always being affected by the gravity of the planet said object originated from. There appears to be life on both planets. However, there are two different populations of a Homo sapiens-like species on either planet, with different physical characteristics in both populations. Research into the gravitational laws of this reality is still ongoing. RPC-848-2 Instance Designation Slash Description Reality Description Notes RPC-848-2-8I1 94A-407 Instance resembles a Dianthus caryophyllus carnation, light orange in coloration. Reality determined to have several more spatial dimensions than baseline reality. Said observation of this reality caused severe headaches, and was later determined that the geometry of objects within the reality was cognitohazardous. Life was encountered within the reality, however, communication was non-feasible as subjects claim that entities also speak in more dimensions than can be naturally perceived. Reality is used for testing involving higher spatial dimensions. RPC-848-2-00Z0-00Z-00Z-00 Instance resembles a Tulipa gesneriana garden tulip, pitch black in coloration. Reality is that of a practical void with no perceivable spatial dimensions present within it. As it is a void, said reality is practically non-traversable, and dangerous to remain within, as having no perception of surroundings causes subjects to enter into a catatonic state after remaining within the void for a period of longer than five minutes. This is broken only by removing the subject from the void. The nature of this reality has made measurements of its ACS level nearly impossible. Research into this void is ongoing. Within all planes of existence, as accessed by RPC-848-1 instances, there existed an iteration of RPC-848, also present with it, was an organization of the native residents of the plane of existence which cared for and maintained the iteration. In instances of RPC-848-2, however, this consistency is not present. Though many did have iterations of RPC-848. A few notable examples did not. It is unclear how the phenomena of RPC-848 begins in the first place. Interviewed, a member of the alleged gardeners of RPC-848 will henceforth be referred to as subject, as they refuse to give a name. The subject is noted as being male, white skin, platinum hair, and gray eyes. Several markings akin to tattoos are present across the body all of which are depictions of various instances of RPC-848-1 and RPC-848-2. Interviewer, Dr. Quincy Forward Interview is noted as being the first contact with the supposed gardeners, after sightings of them were reported by tourists of the park. The interview was initially conducted in Norwegian, but developed into English as the subject displayed knowledge in the language. Begin log Hello Havertu? Translation. Hello, what is your name? Frohe, mit navet ek nabiktin. Oren gode det. Vet du et du ekit tringer et snak norsk? Translation. Why hello? My name is not important. How do you do? You know you don't have to speak Norwegian? What? Um, well, alright then. We have some questions. Tell me. What do you and the other persons we have observed here do? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? We're gardeners. We cultivate existence and display it proudly. What do you mean by existence? How can you ask such a question when you fully understand it? Are you not a display of the majesty of existence? Well, I guess. Yes, I do exist. But let's return to me asking the questions. What are the plant specimens that are present within the area of land that you garden? Are they organic? Is it really so hard to understand? Existence has displayed itself in its entirety to us, and we simply make sure that all of its splendor and grace shine through for all to see. 
Okay. Well, we have seen you weed out several flowers and even chop down some trees. We must ask, why did you choose those particular specimens when you removed them? Well, it's simple. They were merely invasive. My brothers and sisters and I merely sought them out and removed them before they spread throughout existence. Forgive me for making assumptions, but I do not believe any plant specimens you removed were invasive. I mean, I'll admit a sunflower is certainly not native. It is not wise to question your mother's gardening methods, so why do you feel it is any wiser to question a stranger's? Well, you're no ordinary stranger. Oh, well you've caught me. To be truthful, some examples of existence become sickening, both to themselves and to existence as a whole. We cannot allow these examples to spread their sickness to others. It's only natural. I suppose. We'll come back to this subject. Now. Do you know where these plants came from? When were they planted here? We do not know. Certainly before us. Certainly before the Earth. Perhaps even before the Universe. That doesn't make a lot of sense now, does it? Well, this is going nowhere. Now I understand you've got a lot of questions, and perhaps my answers will not satisfy you. But my task is to satisfy you. And seeing as how the only way you will be satisfied is answers my brothers and sisters have deemed sufficient. We are at an impasse. I can, however, propose an alternative. Not an answer, but an agreement. My brothers and sisters have seen you before throughout existence. We have seen the triangle that signifies your presence. Have you now? I assume by you, you mean my organization? Yes. But I must say, you are very curious. You're so… fractured. So inconsistent. Throughout existence, you are everywhere. But you do not take advantage of this. We would like to help you become whole throughout existence. How would you help? The only way we can. We'll allow you to have access to our garden. Access to all of existence. So that you may be whole. Well now, this is quite a proposition. One that I am not able to make alone. I'll have to bring this up with my superiors. Very well, but if we do accept, we have rules. Very strict rules at that. We may discuss those rules at a later date. For now, we will consider your offer. That is all for now. End log. Closing Statement from Dr. Quincy Personally, I do not believe we should accept. For one thing, we have our own method of alternate reality traversal and their insistence on the secrecy of their gardening behavior is also worrisome. I hereby put forth the proposal to not make any agreements with these people until the reasoning behind their actions with destroying plant specimens is made plain. Dr. Quincy Dr. Quincy's insistence on pressuring the gardeners into revealing their knowledge of RPC-848 is noted as causing diplomatic strain between the Authority and the gardeners as a breakdown of communication between the gardeners and the Authority would significantly jeopardize the continued study of the anomaly. Dr. Quincy will be reprimanded for his actions. Security Incident 848-1 Defection of Dr. Quincy to an Unknown Alternate Reality On October 12, 2000, Dr. Walter Quincy, Senior Researcher of RPC-848, broke into the Army of OL Site-042 proceeded to enter RPC-848, and began to fire upon several gardeners. ASF units were alerted and began to search for Dr. Quincy. The gardeners claimed they last saw him making contact with an RPC-848-1 instance, but could not give a specific designation. After this point, several RPC-841-1 instances were destroyed, via detonation of an explosive device attached to the trunk. Dr. Quincy was reported as MIA, as no body was recovered during the incident, and it is highly likely that he escaped into an alternate reality. Dr. Quincy has hereby been labeled a rogue authority element that must be captured by any means possible. A formal apology was delivered to the gardeners, and an offer was made to replant the instances of RPC-848-1 that were destroyed. They declined this offer stating that, in time, a new instance will form in the exact spot where the previous one was. Know the truth. Protect your reality. I don't have much time in writing this. I'm about to commit high treason, but I have to tell the truth. I cannot let them get away with manipulating all of existence.
I was always suspicious of these gardeners. They talk of plants as if they were existence, and they're not wrong. RPC-848 is practically just the multiverse scaled down, which is quite incredible, to say the least, though it begs a lot of questions. But here's where they really made me not trust them. They just wouldn't give up any information as to why they would destroy plants at any given moment. This was a cause for concern for me right away, but apparently not for my superiors, as they went right ahead and buddy-buddied with them on the basis of cost-effectiveness and whatnot. I wasn't going to let them think they could brush off questioning their motives, however, so I set forth an experiment. I made contact with a fellow researcher which specialized in dimensional travel. I won't name him for his protection, that I instructed to send a probe to an alternate reality whose corresponding RPC-848-1 instance was recently chopped down. He agreed to this request, and the results he relayed to me were troubling, furthering my suspicion. He said that he could not access the reality, and that it wasn't the fault of the probe as it had passed its maintenance test. I decided to run another experiment to assemble a hypothesis that I was forming. I made contact with an operative stationed in another reality's iteration of RPC-848, and charged him with observing when the gardeners of that iteration chopped down or removed any plant specimens. I, of course, would be observing from this reality for when the same thing would happen. We communicated through my computer terminal, which had an interdimensional link to that reality. Not a few minutes after I had seen several gardeners remove various plants, the operative responded and said that a similar event had just unfolded in the reality he was stationed in. The most crucial part of this experiment was the specific instances of plants that were taken down. I had recorded one RPC-848-1 instance, as well as four RPC-848-2 instances. Two of them were roses, and the other two were poppies. To my shock, the operative reported each of those as well. I further charged my previously mentioned friend with sending a probe to the reality of the destroyed RPC-848-1 instance. He responded by saying that the probe also could not access that reality. The next revelation was not an experiment, but it did confirm everything I felt towards these people. I was at OL Site-042 trying to formulate my next move, watching when and how many plants were destroyed by the gardeners, when all of a sudden, the operative that I had previously charged with observing the gardeners in an alternate reality sent out several disturbing messages before stopping altogether. To my dismay, that reality's corresponding RPC-848-1 instance was chopped down moments ago. My contact also once again stated that a probe sent to the reality could not access it. Then those gardeners came and reported that the iteration of RPC-848 within that reality was attacked, and the operative was killed defending it. I don't know how they do it, but I do know these things. While they are trees, they don't grow back. No matter how many instances I saw failed, not one grew back. Also, all of a reality's corresponding iterations of a tree must be destroyed for the reality itself to be destroyed. And when it is destroyed, You'll know when it happens. I've got to go now. I'm going to enact a risky plan. I'm leaving for an alternate reality, where the inhabitants are significantly less socially developed, and no organization is formed to maintain the reality's iteration of RPC-848, all the while covering up my tracks as much as I can. I'm going to protect that iteration with my life. You may ask, why don't I just go to my superiors about this? They won't hear a word of it. They're too interested in the anomaly itself to see past its keepers. Please, whoever finds this kill more of those gardeners unless you want this to happen to you. Doc, something wrong. Most of the gardeners have killed themselves by exsanguination. I saw some of them talking with each other as others were doing it. Then they touched some trees and fled to another universe. Is this significant? Corporal Adams Doc, bad news. This reality's ACS level is decreasing out of nowhere. What should I do? Corporal Adams The stars. There's no more stars in the sky. Request evac. Coherency too low for me to perceive which tree is home. Corporal Adams Coherency low. Do not tone. AC Damples All dark. Arts Hiri? t rod Know these signs. Don't let them cut down any more trees. Dr. Quincy
Document AR-114 Through the generosity of the keepers, or gardeners, of RPC-848, they have allowed the authority to catalog the various instances of RPC-848-1 and RPC-848-2 that are present throughout RPC-848. All catalog instances will have a plaque placed near them, designating them as well as the reality is accessed through them. The template for the plaque is as follows. Instance Designation State whether the instance is either a Dash 1 or a Dash 2, as well as its reality designation. Physical Description Describes the physical appearance of the instance. Only applies to RPC-848-2 instances, with certain exceptions. Reality Description A few short paragraphs describing the general appearance of the reality. Notes, if needed, researchers may write down other observations of the reality. Researchers must always check this document to ensure that no instance is being repeatedly designated, or to find newly discovered realities which may be of use by the authority. Instance Designation RPC-848-1-3Y6-49C-807 Reality Description Reality is that of the RCPA timeline, an alternate reality RPC Authority analog which takes on a much more domineering role in the pursuit of containment of the anomalous. Notes, the RCPA does not appear to be aware of their iteration of RPC-848. As such, an operation is being undertaken to permanently conceal it from the RCPA. Instance Designation RPC-848-1-2F9-82W-516 Reality Description Reality is that of Earth, or an Earth-like planet that is part of a quaternary star system. It is unclear if this is a true quaternary system, as all stars are roughly 3 AUs apart. Nonetheless, due to this quaternary system, the planet receives near-constant sunlight on every part of its surface. This does not cause overheating, however, as the planet itself only comes within 3.2 AUs of its perihelion to the smallest star, with 4.6 AUs being its aphelion to the largest. Many lifeforms encountered on the planet have adapted to the always daytime nature of the planet, with most choosing to live in underground caverns and tunnels. Notes. The various RPC-848-1 and-2 instances appear to be plant specimens native to the planet. RPC-848-1 resemble members of the Cataceae family, while the various RPC-848-2 instances are comprised of plant specimens which are generally believed to be flower-like. Instance Designation RPC-848-1-683-19G-218 Reality Description Reality is that of a super-Earth-like planet estimated to be 2.3 times the size of the baseline reality Earth that is entirely covered in ocean, with no visible land in sight. Life on the planet is of course fully aquatic, and as such, most creatures are massive, some measuring up to 150 meters in length. Though most creatures behave similar to how most aquatic life does, there was one entity encountered that displayed sapience. This entity stood at over 300 meters, with a humanoid form and a head that was described as fish-like. No other entity like it was encountered. The entity claimed that the personnel was trespassing on its domain, and offered to show them the way back. Personnel were led to the reality's iteration of RPC-848, and safely returned to baseline reality. The entity asked the personnel never to return. Note, the RPC-848-1 and-2 instances of this reality also appeared to be native aquatic floral specimens, with RPC-848-1 resembling members of the Order Laminarios, and RPC-848-2 resembling various types of coral. Instance Description RPC-848-2-0U4-22V-617 Physical Description Instance resembles a hibiscus syriacus, rose of Sharon, white in coloration. Reality Description When subjects first enter into this reality, they appear to be in a type of throne room, with various entities visible at various points within it. The first entity that is noticed appears to be the leader, or monarch of the court, described as a humanoid entity with a crown made of light. Several other entities stand beside it, 
with their only physical description being that of Chimera. The monarch will proceed to communicate with subjects. The topic of conversation is usually that of the subject describing to the entity their life. After a certain point, the entity will bid the subject farewell, and the subject will return to baseline reality. Subjects will feel a sense of pride and a need for recognition of this entity for the remainder of their lives. Notes, though there is certain similarities, it is unclear if this entity Instance Designation RPC-848-2-7X7-51C-43 Physical Description Instance resembles a Euphorbia pulcherima poinsettia, red in coloration. Reality Description Subjects will first enter into a large carpeted room, with walls similar to that of marble, and various pieces of furniture are visible in the surrounding area. Straight ahead is a type of fireplace, suspected to be natural. To the left of the large window, visible on the outside of it, there appears to be a spiral galaxy, estimated to be the same size as Andromeda. A humanoid entity can be seen sitting in a chair, facing the fireplace, with most of its body not visible to subjects. When subjects attempt to communicate with this entity, the entity will tell subjects to stop bothering them, and should only speak if they have received an invitation. Further communication will prompt the entity to direct them to the corner of the room, where an RPC-848-1 instance resides. If subjects attempt to approach the entity to view its face, they will find themselves thrown towards the RPC-848-1 instance by an unseen force, and sternly warned to leave immediately. Note, it is unclear if the room is its own reality or if it is merely a small part of a reality. Attempts to learn of and secure an invitation to speak with the entity further is ongoing. Instance Designation RPC-848-1-4Q1-AAL-84A 848 Reality Description Reality is that of the Remnants Timeline, an alternate reality authority counterpart that underwent a reality-wide event known as the Alpha Trigger, that caused an uncontrollable expansion of anomalous phenomena, leading to the breakdown of chain of command, and subsequent dissolution of that authority counterpart. Notes, instance of RPC-848 within the reality appears to have been completely destroyed by unknown means, though several people are noted to have escaped prior to its destruction. Research into its destruction is ongoing. Instance Designation RPC-848-1-6G7-54F-4359 Reality Description Reality is, reality is determined to be similar to Baseline. However, the anomalous in this reality is fully known and ingrained into society. Explorations into the history of AR-6G7-54F-435 Reveals that the authority of this reality was unable to re-establish presence in America, crippling Authority 6G7 54F 435, and preventing them from relocating their anomalies in command structure in 1906. After the Union eliminated colonial presence of the Octoritas Imperatus during the American Revolution. As a result, the remaining Authority 6G7 54F 435 forces were overrun during World War I, as news of anomalous America spread worldwide, causing both the Allied and Axis powers to unite against Authority 6G7 54F 435, effectively destroying it. This also resulted in World War II never taking place, as well as various other changes that occurred as a result of this. Note, Given that this reality's inhabitants regard Authority 6G7-54F-435 the same way Nazis are regarded in our reality, it is imperative that they never learn of our reality. Instance Designation RPC-848-1-1S3-71A-69 Reality Description RPC-690A Gardeners in this reality regularly engage in fornication with the local fauna, visitors, and other gardeners. MST Zulu 2 Muzar, have been able to confirm that this is, indeed, the same alternate reality as that accessed by RPC-690. Notes, research into transportation potential is underway. <laughs>